Der ist gut. Oh, ich bleibe, dass der ist gut in mein Herz. <lacht> ist das Afrikaans? <lacht> Who are the first year student? Any first year student can come quickly and get the book, and that will be yours. Oh. <lacht> <laughs> Good. That's the story of my life. And uh, I'm just signing a contract to, for a movie and uh, getting lawyers to put things together for this great movie of this great sinner with a great savior. Amen. Praise his Lord. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm an African, as I always say, an African. God blessed us with time, and we can go up to midnight to f tomorrow morning preaching. When you are forgiven too much, you love too much, and you talk too much. Amen. But those who have been forgiven little, they preach also for two minutes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, praise his name. I would like to come, Brother Spiro, where are you? Please, can you come forward? Um, I think this is my last trip, or maybe last, or where, I don't know, but... Uh, Uh, this is my last, and I'll be going back to Malawi, not to sit, not to retire, but I have a vision to go and do two types of ministry, two extremes. One, to go into the rural areas, deep into the rural areas, and preach the gospel. So I've formed a little teamlets of, of four or five each into the rural areas, bought them some generators and so on, and with the bicycles, so we are reaching out to the rural areas, so there's no retirement. Amen. But the other extreme will be, I have a vision to minister to the top class people, from the president, cabinet ministers, diplomats, And this will be my area of ministry in Malawi, reaching out to these corrupt people. If you put a corrupt person in parliament, you have got corrupt government. Are we together? That's why I'm trying to push as many Christians to go into politics. Because the more you let these people go in, they corrupt the government. They go from bad to worse. So that's where, when I go to Malawi, I have a, a ministry called Presidential Prayer Breakfast. Now this is a subtle name, Presidential Prayer Breakfast, because I want to get the president himself. So we have to use his name, Presidential Prayer Breakfast. <laughs> Amen. And so we'll be inviting cabinet ministers, diplomats, or you know, general managers of different uh, companies and so on, reaching out to them with the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These people don't hear the gospel. They have no time for church. But I'll make a church for them. Hallelujah. You know, to get to these high-class people, you get them through the hotels. When they come for breakfast, for lunches, for dinner, you get them through their stomachs. When they eat, I hammer them. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that's good strategy, isn't so? Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'll be doing. So this June, I'll be going back to Malawi. Then I was praying for almost two years for God to give someone who would replace me. So I thank God for Sipiwe, who is an Anglican priest, 
And, you know, first time to see a born-again Anglican priest. <laughs> well, in South Africa, but uh, Uganda, we've got lots of them. <laughs> but I want to praise God for this young man as you heard this testimony. So he will be taking over my position. He will be preaching. And don't stop inviting him here. Amen. Please invite him as, mu as much as you can. And I'll be going with him to Namibia to Shofar Conference. So we'll be together in Namibia to, uh, at the Shofar Conference. So I'm introducing, introducing him into Shofar. So he'll be smelling Shofar next time, <laughs> like me. <laughs> so I want him to pray before I preach. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you this evening. We praise you because you are God alone. We thank you for the Holy Spirit which is moving in this place. We thank you, God. We thank you very much for what you are about to do in this place. We truly believe that you are God who is doing many things in every day and every hour. So, God, we pray for your servant, Stephen, as he is about to minister to us. May your Holy Spirit inspire him. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. My wife couldn't be here. She's in Malawi. Last year when I came here, she was in England for six months. And I was a senior bachelor for six months. And uh, I was cooking bent offerings all the time. <laughs> Each time. And I would take a towel to wipe away the smoke. The whole kitchen was full of smoke. And no smoke went straight to heaven. I think I've got too many sins. <laughs> but uh, uh, when she came back uh, last November, she had to rush to Malawi when our daughter, our third-born daughter, was taken seriously ill. She's better now, we thank God. Uh, she will be coming next week, um, uh, next week when we arrive in Peter Marisbeck. Amen. What a great woman of God. And I thank God for my wife. She's uh, my great blessing in my life. I am what I am because of this great woman. I wouldn't have been a preacher if it was for this lady. She married me who never went to school. And she's well educated, but she married me not because I had a Mercedes Benz or a good account, or a BMW. She married me when I didn't have even grade one. I didn't have even any education. And the time I was proposing love to her, my vocabulary was going this way and that way and that way. I didn't know which was adjective or noun or whatever. Everything went zigzag. And she was uh, shocked to hear this guy who is proposing love to me, who couldn't speak English properly. All the time in my mind, I wanted her to say, no, Stephen, I don't love you. So that I could go back to the mountain, to God, and say, God, I told you that nobody will love me. But God shocked me when she said, she, she said yes. I love her. I, said, Ooh, I didn't know what to say next. <laughs> so instead, I said, can we pray? So I prayed the longest prayer you have ever heard. Because I was afraid if I say amen, and she looks at me in the eyes, what will I say? So I prayed on and on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. So we got married. And she became my best teacher. So I'm speaking in English because of this woman who had to teach me how to write and how to read. So I'm speaking in English today because this wonderful wife has taught me. It takes a great woman, a saint of a woman to teach a husband. But also it takes a husband who is humble to be taught by a wife. Because we men, we use baritone voice.
to threaten our world. <laughs> but yes, my wife was wonderful, and we have been married now 48 years together, and I still love her, I still kiss her. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Praise his name. So I still, we, I don't know where the last time we ever argued. I don't know which year we last argued. But I thank God that she has been my mentor, my teacher, who has taught me manners. I didn't know manners at all. And I was eating like a pig because I grew up under a bridge. So my wife said, honey, can you shut your mouth? So I learned to shut my mouth to eat like Afrikaners. <laughs> uh, so I'm eating good with my mouth closed. Amen. Praise God. And those who, young people, who are looking for a wife, don't jump because she's pretty. No. But go to God. And she must come to God. At the foot of the cross, if you meet there, it will be a glorious marriage. Amen. If you meet at the foot of the cross together, it will be a glorious marriage. Because at the cross, there is forgiveness. You forgive each other. And at the cross, you admire your wife every day. She is precious. She is lovely. She will hug her, you kiss her because you have met at the foot of the cross. Amen. So, young people, if you marry someone, you will fall in love with someone. You are not uh, falling in love with an angel. No, any woman, all man is not an angel. We call each other, I've got an angel. Oh, you cry. <laughs> Because the angels have got swords. <laughs> they carry swords, you, you cry. You make one mistake, chop. <laughs> but marry a human being who is a sinner saved by the grace of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So tonight, uh, is, oh, I've got already 15 minutes, my brother. Or oh, 20 minutes, or I am about to close. <laughs> okay, I've got 30 minutes. <clears throat> In Genesis chapter 8, let's look at Genesis chapter 8. There's only one, uh, there's one verse there. The two sides of the coin, that's the theme of my message. Uh, I had prepared... Uh, a message I was going to preach from the book of Luke, chapter 2. Uh, but as I was coming here, I got a text message from my dear brother, can you share 50-50? So I said, well, what I would prepared, I will lay aside. Let me speak about something else. The two sides of the coin. The first side of the coin is the side of God. The first side of the coin is the side of God. The second side of the coin is the side of you and me. The side of you and me. We have our side to play. God has his side to play. Are we together? So God has his side. Just as we used to play the old records and we used to play the old tape Tape, uh, what, what? Eh? Cassette, oh yeah, the cassette. You played side A and then side B. <laughs> oh, you would dance side A, oh my, wow, wow, and then you come to side B. But we stopped those uh, uh, cassettes. We come to CD. A CD, you play one side only, and the other side is silent. The same with God. Right now in your life, you are playing your side. God's side is silent, waiting for the judgment day. And that day it will be God's side to speak to all those who have been living in sin. 
That's why my preaching tonight is to turn you aside to the side of God where you can have fellowship with God that Jesus takes away your guilty and he is punished on the cross taking your place so that the condemnation doesn't come upon you but comes on Jesus. Amen. So I'm not preaching something which is mysterious because I, for one, I am the testimony of what Jesus did on the cross. I didn't like Christianity. I didn't like Jesus. To me, Jesus was a white man. The Bible was a white man's book. There was no way I could believe in the white man's book. And if you came to me at that time, with the Bible, I'll give you a bullet. If you came to me mentioning the name of Jesus, I'll give you a bullet. I hated the Bible. I hated God. I had questions, why me? Why me? Many of you are here tonight, you maybe have got the same question like me. But this is the message I want to share with you before I share my testimony. Um, Genesis chapter 8, are we together? Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Genesis chapter 8, I love this chapter. <clears throat> in chapter 7, you know, Noah is in the ark. When God commands Noah in the ark, a mosquito and his wife in the ark. A toto is in with his wife, in the ark. Elephant with his sweetheart in the ark. Lion with his honey in the ark. There was no male to male, no. Are we together? Otherwise, if there was male to male, there was no production. That was the end of the generation. But God is clever. God has his wisdom that he takes male and female, the way he produced when he said, it is very good. When he created you, men, or we men, 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 we men, with beard, rough on the chest, he said, it is good. <laughs> he finished there, it is good. <laughs> and he, did, he didn't even pat himself on the shoulder, no, he just said, it is good. But he, he says, well, let me redesign this man. When he redesigned the man and took the rib, one rib, not one ribs, one rib and redesigned a person called a woman. The shape of the head was different. The shape of the neck was a little bit longer. And the shape of this part was, in, you know. <laughs> and the shape of this part was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the way she walked, she didn't walk like a man, like a soldier. No, she twisted a little bit. <laughs> what a wonderful God we have. Hallelujah. That's why when I look at my wife, I, when I, I see her walking, I say, wow. <laughs> Some that don't admire their wives, they say, what? Why did I create such a big fat woman? <laughs> they condemn their wives while she's walking. But God, when he finished creating the woman, he takes her to the man. And the man was excited. Hallelujah. And then God says, he pats himself. Wow! You know, it's a wow business when God created a woman. For a man, he said, oh, it is good. <laughs> but when he brought the woman, he says, wow! Ooh. It's a wow business. And, you know, I thought ladies were going to say amen. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah. So he created the woman, and then God 
two by two, everything two by two, all in the ark. But they came like the whole worship team which was here, all taking them and confined them in one place for 150 days. 150, confined in one place like this. You know, that's where they were. As you are, maybe a first year student, second year, third year, you are confined to a particular lifestyle of your daily life. You think you are free, but you are not free. You are confined in that little arc of your world. Some are confined in a very small cigarette. They can't stop smoking. You are confined there. You are hooked there. You go where the ship goes. That's how your life is. You are so confined. Some they are confined in the spirit of fear. They can't face tomorrow. They are anxious about tomorrow. They are confined in their anxiety. Or maybe they are financial uh, 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 financial constraints. They are confined in that ship. When it uh, swerves like this, you are stuck in that that uh, that ark. You are confined. Noah and his family they were confined there. And maybe you are saying, God, when will I be free? When you walk around here at Stellenbosch, you are still confined in this little Stellenbosch. Some are confined in their religion. Confined in their religion. You are so hooked in their religion. I belong to this. Billy Graham once said to a man, are you, are you a Christian? He says, no, I am a Baptist. You know, he, Billy Graham asked, are you a Christian? He said, no, I am a Baptist. You see the difference? He refused that I was not a Christian, but I'm a Baptist. So many people, they are confined to their religious names. You know, when people came, they came with different names. Oh, this is this, this is that. So we are confined in our religious, you know, environment. We think that's life. So for me, I was confined in my gang. The gang was my only, only family. The family I called was my own gang. My two revolvers were my buddies. My AK-47 was my buddy. If I didn't use my revolver, I wouldn't feel good because I was confined in this little boat of my gang. I was confined. So, in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, let's read together. The Bible says, but God, hallelujah, Whew, I love that. It didn't say, but the pastor sees us, no. It says, but God, not but a pastor, not but a bishop, not but a apostle, not a prophet, no, but God. Daniel said, there is a God in heaven. That's what Daniel said. A young boy who was living in that corrupt world, but he learned to recognize that there was a God in heaven. God has brought you at, at Stellenbosch not to study, but God has brought here for a purpose, for a purpose that you may know there is a God in heaven. Hallelujah. There is a God in heaven. And so fulfill that promise when you know, you recognize him as God. But God in his love, he wants to take you in your confinement. Now this is it. But God remembered Noah. Hallelujah. Tonight, but God remembers you. God remembers you in your confinement. He says, this young man, 
this young girl confined, some that are confined to their sexual passions, confined the way, the way they think, all these thoughts are so evil about sex, 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 confined in that, in that boat. God tonight wants to give you deliverance. I said God tonight wants to give you deliverance. Hallelujah. You are confined that. But tonight, God remembers you. God remembers you. Hallelujah. That's God's side. When he remembers you, he doesn't leave you there alone. He remembers you. When he remembers you, he visits the ark. Hallelujah. Then the water subsidized. And... That's God's part. He remembers you. God remembered me. When my mother rejected me at the age of four, living under a bridge, eating from the garbage beans, never had any education, I used to ask, God, where are you? Three times I wanted to commit suicide. How many of you have attempted to commit suicide? You have told yourself, it's better to die. But remember, God remembers you. Even tonight, in that spirit of committing a, you know, suicide, God remembers you. Isn't that exciting? That when, you know, Zuma will never remember you. Never. But God will remember you. Amen. God will remember you. Tonight, he remembers you. So that's God's side because he remembers you. But the second part the, of the other coin is in Luke. Are we together? Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. Is it? Is it oh. Luke 23, verse 42. It reads... <coughs> Then he said, <laughs> this is a thief crucified with Jesus on the cross. The thief on the left blasphemed God. It is the way you look at Jesus, that's the way you talk to him. To him. But this other man looked at Jesus as God, as the Savior, as the Redeemer, then he said to Jesus, listen to this. Then he said to Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you enter into the kingdom of God. Whew. Oh. Some of us, uh, I've been to White House, and when I went to White House, I was a big African from Africa. When you enter into this amazing presidential. <laughs> you are so stupid. <laughs> because everything. Uh, I look down. So stupid. <laughs> but this man didn't ask for the White House. He says, remember me. When you enter your kingdom. Tonight I want you to get out from that ark. From that confinement. You say, God, remember me tonight. I want to come into your kingdom. That's why Jesus says, repent. Now repent is four steps. Number one, repentance is a change of mind. You can never repent if you have not made up in your mind. Make it your mind tonight. Before you live through those doors, you say, Hey, God, I've been confined in my church, in my Presbyterian, in my Baptist, in my end here. I've been confined there, but down in my spiritual life. Never saw you as God. But today, God... Remember me, God. Remember me. How many of you want God to remember you? 
You say, God, I've been so bound with cigarettes. I've been so bound with sex outside me. I've been so bound with this and that. God, remember me. Tonight is your night. I say tonight is your night. Hallelujah. Tonight is your night. I was a murderer. I was a drug addict. I saw other people's lives as, as shadows. So when you see a shadow, you want to eliminate a shadow. I had my gang of 40 boys. And that's why the name of my gang was called the Black Shadows. No one ever met with the Black Shadows, walked away alive. I hated white people. I hated the Bible. I said, the white man, the only time you greet a white man, when you kill him first, then greet him later. We are very safe tonight, don't worry. <laughs> Amen. That's why I'm preaching at you. <laughs> but before, you'd been my target to kill. I hated white people with passion, with passion. Many times I'll see a white man, I'll shake, just want to kill him. Because the white man had said, Stephen, you are a baboon. You are a kefir. You are a nobody. And I said, I will revenge to a white man. That's why when I became a gorilla fighter in Zimbabwe, I, I was merciless. If there was a guy who was merciless, was me. I didn't have mess in my vocabulary. I didn't have love in my vocabulary. I didn't have kindness in my vocabulary. Those words were for sissies. I was not a sissy. When I meant killing, I meant killing. Even my own gang. I was unpredictable to my own gang. I told my own gang, if you ever laugh in my gang, I'll kill you. I was a, an introvert person, very quiet. They didn't know what I might do next. I remember one day one of my gang members was laughing, going around. The, I followed him. I said, why are you laughing? He said, I was laughing. Up, and I pulled on my gun and shot him on his leg. You never laugh in my, in my gang. Can you imagine from the age of six, I never laughed until when I was 20 years old. I mean, when you don't laugh, you are like an animal. You are merciless. You operate in the authority of all demons. But that day, I remember after fighting in the bush for five years, as a gorilla fighter, I had to, we had to sing in the bush, there's no God, there's no God. Communism is good. My religion was Marxism. So I decided to go to every church and blow it up with bombs to every government institution. And so one day, I uh, was going to plant a bomb at the, at the bank. As we went out that, uh, that evening, on Sunday evening, we saw a big tent by the roadside. They were singing about Jesus. And that tent was from South Africa. And I said, there's nothing good that, came from, that can come from South Africa. I said, guys, before we get to the bank, let's go to that tent. Get your AK-47. Spray the bullets to everyone inside. I want every person to die inside. I was going to kill 3,000 people in one night. And as we go to, go to the tent, they said, what time, Stephen, should we start shooting? I said, 7 o'clock sharp. They said, but it is 5 to 7. What do we do in five minutes? But up to now, I don't know why we didn't blow it up at 5 to. <laughs> you know, when you are dealing with God, God confuses even your time. <laughs> even your watch. So, I said, well, since I've got five minutes, let's go inside and look at the people about to kill. And after two minutes only, 
we gave God two minutes. Just for two minutes, we go inside and we look at the people about to kill. After two minutes, we go out. So we entered in that tent and sat right at the back, the last, last bench near the entrance. When 20 of us sat on that bench, the tent was 100% full. That was the last bench. As if it was reserved for us. I think God was delaying some people who were coming. He said, stop, stop, stop. There's this gang coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ooh, the way God works is wonderful. Eh? So we entered that tent <coughs> and sat right at the back. They were singing choruses, South African choruses. Hey, man, we sang out of tune at the back to disturb the meeting. And one preacher came and touched me. He said, boys, you are making noise. And I pulled out my knife. I said, preacher, if you touch me again, I'll kill you. And everyone was shocked because there was not that character when I pull out my knife, I use it. When I pull out my gun, I would use it. But that night, I warned the preacher. And all my gang members were, what? I said, why are you looking at me? I said, you just warned that preacher. Because that was not my character. If I pulled out a knife, I would use it straight away. But I said, if you touch me, I'll kill you. That shocked my whole gang. Then a lady jumped to this preacher and said, please walk away from these boys that are dangerous. So he walks away. I started tossing my knife up and down. Then they invited a pretty girl from Soweto, Johannesburg. Man, she was gorgeous. Man, she was a smasher. Ah, ho, ho. Ooh, that girl was beautiful, pretty. And she put me off balance. I was confused because first time I've never seen a woman preaching. I was, as a Presbyterian, we never allowed women to preach. And so this young lady was sharing a test, but where she stood, like there were bulbs around her, globes around She was shining with the glory of God. And that affected my eyes. And I said to my friend on my right, do you see that girl shining? My friend says, no. She's not shining. I said, said to my friend on my left, you see that girl shining? He said, no, she's not shining. I said, what type of eyes do you have, you guys? <laughs> what I saw, they couldn't see. I saw the glory of God around this girl. But God has a sense of humor. He uses a girl to attract me to stay in. So, <coughs> when, when she handed over the meeting to the one, this preacher, this man stood up from Johannesburg. He read two verses, Romans 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Can you pour me some water, please? <coughs> So he read another scripture, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter verse, verse, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty you may be rich in Christ. Thank you. <coughs> so as he read the scripture, after reading the scripture, he was holding his Bible. After reading the scripture, he looked at us. He started crying. Instead of preaching, he started weeping. Tears falling on his Bible. And I said, what's wrong with this preacher? He was crying, but his sharp eyes looked at us. And then he said his first words. I am crying because the Spirit of God is telling my spirit right now that so many people seated here tonight are going to die. I said, uh oh, who told him what we're about to do? <laughs> I said, guys, get ready with your guns. So I took one of my guns from the back, tucked it in front. We started making our hand grenades ready to explode. And there, this man, he says, tonight, I'm going to talk about God's transaction. If you surrender your life to Jesus, 
in return, in one package, is going to give you four things. Number one, he's going to give you his forgiveness. Number two, he's going to give you his joy. Number three, his peace. The world cannot give you that type of peace. Number four, your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. My brothers, that night, I had to repent. I got into the scriptures because repentance is a change of mind. Number two, it must give you a radical change of your nature and a radical change of your, your, your actions and a radical change of your directions. If these four things haven't happened to your life, you haven't repented because you are still going the old direction. Repentance is turn around. Move the opposite direction. If you are going this way, you turn around this way. You follow Jesus. Because when Jesus says, come unto me, he means just that. Leave everything else. Let me be the Lord of your life, the Savior of your life, your father, your mother. I'll be everything to you. Amen. Some of you come from broken homes broken marriages, like me. But there's hope in Christ. There's hope in Christ. I want you tonight to say, yes, my parents divorced, but I have the heavenly father. My mother, when they dumped me, little did they know that this boy one day will be preaching in Stellenbosch, in America, in Parliament in Australia, who preach at the Pentagon. Little did she know that when I'm dumping this boy, the same boy will travel around the world. She, she didn't know. I was, she was dumping an evangelist. But she was dumping me to leave me to die. But God had, had another purpose for me. God has another purpose for you. Some of you, you stay one week with your mother, another week with your father, another week with... You are split in two. And inside you, there is no joy. But tonight, let me tell you, there is hope in Christ. Because God tonight has remembered you. And also tonight, do your part. Jesus, remember me when you enter the kingdom of God. Repentance is that sentence, repent for. Don't miss this word for. For you miss this word, you have missed the whole essence of repentance. Because for leads you for the kingdom of God. You repent because of the kingdom of God. When you enter into the kingdom of God, even your lifestyle of walking changes. The way you dress changes. All these, what you have these days, they call what? The, the cleavage, cleave, what? Cleavages. Ooh, oh, I don't know where they came from. From hell. Showing off your breasts. No. When you are in the kingdom of God, your dressing lifestyle is different. You honor God with your body. You honor God with your dressing. You honor God the way you treat your girlfriend. You honor God the way you handle your girl, girlfriend. Are we together? I know you will not invite me, but there's no problem. I'm going to this year in June. <laughs> but you know, you honor God with all your lifestyle. Amen. Oh, in those days, we used to have this bell bottle, uh, what? <laughs> bell bottle, the bitter, uh, <laughs> tight ones. You, I think you had to use soap <laughs> to wear them. <laughs> they were so tight. <laughs> but when I came to Jesus, my dressing changed. My way of walking changed. I could almost hear my shoes saying, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> you change everything because 
God has remembered you tonight. God in your situation has remembered you tonight. God will remember you tonight in your financial uh, constraints. God will remember you. Who will remember you. I am a person who came to Christ with zero. I had zero budget, no education. But God says, I've remembered you, Stephen. I've remembered you. When he remembered me, God took me away from the bridge. Now I live in a very top executive among the cabinet ministers. God, I didn't buy that house. One man, as I was preaching, they were crying in the church. And they came to me and said, Brother, you have mended our marriage. We want to give you a gift. I thought it was maybe a car or what. But they got, me, got in their car. We drove elsewhere. We got at this brand new house they had not even entered in. They had finished building. said, here are the keys. This is your house. And the following day, we changed the title deed. So I'm living in a palace, you know, because God remembered me. From the bridge to where I stay. Last year, but one, uh, God remembered me. Someone called me from John Baker, Stephen, do you know where Toyota McCarthy is? I said, yes. He said, go there. I went there. I stood there around this one car. I was at, I said, if God could give me a car, take it to Malawi, but I won't put a canopy. Although it's a double K, but I won't put a canopy. I want to use the back as my pulpit to preach in the marketplaces. So I was standing there. The manager came and says, can I help you, sir? I said, uh, I'm just looking at the car. I said, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I said, oh, nonsense. You are poor. He walks away. <laughs> so suddenly the phone calls again. And I'm answer. I said, can you uh, give your, t uh, your cell phone to the manager? So I took it and I said, someone wants to talk to you, to you sir. And I left him. And I went to the car again, stood there. <laughs> So as after a few minutes, he comes back, said, sir, congratulations. I said, what? He says, this is your car. I said, what? He says, it's your car. It has been paid for. Paid by who? The man who called you. You know, God is God. When he, become, he remembers you, he gives you everything. I've never been in a shop to buy even the suits I wear, the things I have. At my house, I came from Malawi with two suitcases with my wife. But God remembered us. He has provided everything I need. What a wonderful God. Hallelujah. What a wonderful God. God tonight is going to remember you. You have been struggling with maybe financial constraints. How will I pay school fees? But tonight, God remembers you. But when he remembers you, do your part. Remember me when you enter in your kingdom. If you want to enter in your kingdom, come to Jesus. You say, God, I want you to touch me. And for me that night, as the preacher was preaching, God remembered me. Seven o'clock, a gang leader. Seven o'clock, a murderer. Seven o'clock, a drug addict. By eight o'clock, when the preacher was preaching, I didn't like his finger. Every time he pointed that finger like he was pointing at me. He would point this direction like the finger was bending towards me. And he would point this way like the finger was bending towards me. I took out my knife to kill my friend. And I said, why did you tell the preacher about my sins? And he took out his knife. I said, I also kill you. You told him about mine too. So we faced each other with our knives. But that finger made me restless. I couldn't hide every time he would do this, I would duck down. When he would point, I would duck down. But uh, uh, hey, you can't hide from the finger of God. I started crying under deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. And with my AK-47, my bombs, I started walking forward. I didn't wait those who want Jesus to put up your hand. Or, no, while he was still preaching, I came forward. I was the only sinner. That came forward out of 3,000. And that night, only one sinner came to Christ. 
and the preachers were disappointed. Only one pathetic boy. My hair was full of lies. I was thinking I never had a bath for many months. I was horrible. I came forward. Even the preacher had his handkerchief on his nose. That's how stinking I was. But that night, my brothers and sisters, heaven was smiling. I've remembered this boy tonight. And me too, I say, God, remember me tonight. Remember me. And God remembered me. I asked God to remember me. Both sides of the coin worked together. And I became what I am today. And the following day, I went to the police to surrender myself. After eight hours of interrogation, the police said, if your Jesus has forgiven you, we forgive you too. The Bible says, if the Son of Man shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. I was free at last. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then the verse was read to me, Psalms 27, verse 10. Though your father and mother forsake you, I will receive you. My mother forsook me. My father forsook me. I became a bridge boy, a beggar, eating from the garbage beans. All my life from the age of four, I was eating from stale food, rotten food in the garbage beans. But at the age of 20, Jesus remembered me. He remembered me. Tonight, Jesus wants to remember you. In all your situations, he wants to remember you. You say, God, here I am. Shall we stand?